Welcome to the Four Visions Market Podcast, a space built on the principles of integrity and reciprocity. Together, we will engage in thought-provoking conversations about plant medicines, why these plants are coming out of the rainforests, jungles, and mountains after thousands of years, and what it means to be in right relationship with the ancestral wisdom cultures and guardians of these traditions. I'm your host, Mariah Ganessa, founder and director of Four Visions Market. This podcast is the natural evolution in our commitment to providing you, our tribe, with incredible resources to support you on your healing journey through plant medicines. Welcome home. Hello, soul family, and welcome back to another episode of the Four Visions Market podcast. I'm so excited to share with you today's episode where we are joined by the beautiful Mary Lou Shin, who is an incredible medicine woman with tremendous wisdom and teachings to share about how to walk the path in a good way, in a sacred way. Mary Lou is initiated in the Peruvian shamanic traditions. She is a Mesa carrier connected to the wisdom traditions of the Quedos people of the High Andes and is a medicine woman truly embodying the wisdom of what it means to walk with the Great Mother, with Mother Earth. And so I know that you are going to love today's episode. We get into some incredible conversations talking about soul purpose and how to live in alignment, what it means to walk this path with righteousness, how to honor traditions and lineages, She shares some incredible wisdom about the Caro cosmology that just blew my mind and really shook me to my core, resonating on such deep levels. And I know that you will love uh, this conversation as well. And so I hope you enjoy. Thanks for tuning in. A quick word from our sponsors before we begin this episode. Today's episode is brought to you by the Summa Kausai Music Festival in partnership with Four Visions Market and Finca Ambiwasi. We welcome you to join us in Colombia at Finca May 30th through June 2nd, 2023 for four days of epic music, celebration, teachings from wisdom keepers, plant medicine, and community building. Suma Kausai is an Ingano term meaning the good life, and this festival will truly embrace the joy and sweetness that this good life has to offer us. Headlining, we have some incredible world-renowned musicians, including Pia, Ajit, and Grupo Puto Mayo. Our lineup is full of beautiful medicine musicians from the Fingambi Wasi family, as well as Colombian musicians and some more surprise guests. Learn more about the event by going to tinyurl.com slash Suma Kausai Festival. That's Suma, S-U-M-A, Kausai, C-A-U-S-A-Y Festival. This is an all-inclusive event that includes pickup and drop-off at Bogota Airport, all food and accommodations, and all the incredible concerts, workshops, and offerings during our four days together. Due to the size of our center, the festival is limited to 50 participants and we're filling up quickly. If you feel the call to join us this spring, don't wait. Sign up today to reserve your spot at this super special healing event. Welcome, Mary Lou. Thank you so much for being here and joining us on the podcast today. Thank you, Mariah, for the invitation. I'm happy to be here and to share with your community. Mm. We're excited and I feel like this conversation is going to be full of a lot of beautiful seeds of wisdom and wonderful insight. And I'm looking forward to getting to share this conversation with with our tribe and our platform as well. And so uh, with that, you know, I would love to just jump right in and ask you to share a little bit about your journey and your path and a little bit about who you are. You know, I think that if you could start with a little bit also about how your upbringing informed the path that you ended up taking and and share a little bit about your background so that we can get to know you a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so it definitely, for me, my path started with my upbringing in Mexico City. I always say that I was raised in a land that you know, wax in between two timelines. One is the 
pre-conquest mystic land of my ancestors from the lands of Anahuac, Mexico, and the post-colonial world. So there is still so much there to be rediscovered and retrieve, reclaim. So growing up, I always had a sense that I was perhaps like, you know, an ancient soul, had like a lot of visions of me being in those lands and being a high priestess, a medicine woman, deeply connected with the shamanic traditions of Mexico. And so that, that always was around me in my rattle. And I will always have encounters with guides and spirits and will, you know, share that with the kids in the neighborhood. And they will always say like, no, I think you're making all these things up. But yeah, I always had like this strong pull to, towards the ancient medicine of Mexico and yeah, the mysticism, the plant-based ceremonies and knowledge. And so, you know, growing up, I, you know, went to a more mainstream, you know, career and tried to become a therapist, but that never felt in alignment until I traveled to Peru in 2005. And in Peru, it's just like I had this reawakening, almost like what I experienced growing up in Mexico City was reactivated because the wisdom traditions of Peru are very much alive and intact, more so than the ones in Mexico. So for me, that was like a remembrance and Then I was initiated into the Mesa tradition of the high Andes. And even though they're very different in a lot of ways, there's also a lot of similarities in the cosmovision that they share and the way that they relate to the earth. So it was for me like coming back to my own ancestral wisdom and knowledge through the lineage of the Kero people, which is also so rooted in ancestral medicine. So through that lineage of the Kero, then I remember and reclaim my own ancestral roots. And so I've been walking this path um, for the last 13 years, almost, or more than 13 years, 15 years. Um, um, yeah, sharing medicine, sharing the wisdom, sharing the old ways of seeing, the old ways of being, the way uh, my ancestors and the indigenous people of Peru relate to life and to the web of life. So I'm sharing that in communities where people can begin to reconnect deeper to the cycles of the earth and to live a more harmonious and conscious life. So beautiful. I love how you were sharing about how your journey in a different land, in a land that is not your bloodline, ended up awakening and bringing you full circle to your connection with your ancestors and the connection with uh, your ancestral traditions and your healing path. And I would love to go a little deeper into that because, you know, I think a lot of us who are walking a healing path find ourselves pulling from traditions that perhaps are not from our heritage. They're not from our own blood lineage. And uh, you, you know, you you have undergone um, a decade long apprenticeship, I believe, with the Kedos, and so you you've been putting in that time, really, you know, humbly learning at the feet of your elders, receiving this lineage in a good way, and really with a lot of devotion. And so, I would love for you to share with us a little bit about any insights that you've had a- along your journey of what it means to study in a lineage that's not your own, perhaps as well as any understandings that you might be able to reflect to us about how we can go about walking the medicine path in a good way and what does that really entail? Thank you. So for me, definitely, what is very important is that we take the time to become a wisdom keeper or a one that carries a lineage takes a time. It's not something that one can master through a certification, like, you know, six months or a year certification. This is a, becomes a life path and it becomes a way of living. And even if we are no part of the tradition by blood, we can still be worthy carriers as long as we come with the right intention. One of the things that I feel that really harms the 
traditions and ancient knowledge is when we convolute and mismatch and create, you know, our own interpretation of things. And that's how like the medicine and the wisdom gets diluted. I see that as a symptom of our colonial past. I feel that we are all searching and trying to like reconnect to our roots and our ancestors and, the, you know, the original group blueprint of where we're coming from. But in that process, we oftentimes create harm and dilute. So it's important, again, that we take the time. It's a time honor approach. Um, usually it takes a few years to get to know the language and the medicine and the rhythm of a lineage. And I always say that it's not something that we can acquire through a certification. Even though certifications can be great tools, there's nothing more potent and powerful than actually going to the land, learning directly from the original keepers of the lineages because they remain connected to the lineage in ways that we here in the West are not. So yeah, very important to go and spend time with the original carriers. You know, us in the West, the Western mind is so trained to do everything fast you know, and we really value achievement and physical success, you know, that that certificate, like you said, or the or the degree. And so because we have put so much value in that as a society, we see a lot of times this desire to, you know, get certified or to become a practitioner. And it really does come from this uh, impatience that has been so deeply ingrained in our mentality, in our society. And so I love that you mentioned that because there's such medicine in just slowing down and taking the time to immerse yourself in a tradition and recognizing that there's there's no, there's no where you're trying to get to. The journey is the the study, and that really is, you know, what the spiritual path is about. You know, step by step, day by day, doing the work, and and not needing to get anywhere. And so that really resonated for me because it's definitely been part of my own journey, my own personal study of how I can slow down and be present uh, in the study and, and celebrate each lesson, each teaching, each ceremony, each time I get to sit with my elders and just savor it, you know, and it doesn't come naturally. So thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's so important that we, again, you know, let the medicine and the wisdom steepen so that it becomes embody. It's not something that mm -hmm. we do, it's something that we embody and we become. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a lot of your teachings focus around helping people to discover their purpose. And you, I, I was on your website and I saw that you talk a lot about this, this discovering of sacred purpose. And I think this is such a, a wonderful topic, especially in today's day and age where so many people are choosing to leave perhaps jobs or commitments that they took on out of societal conditioning and are choosing to go find something that resonates with their heart and speaks to their soul's calling. And I would love to hear a little bit more about um, your experience discovering your own soul's purpose, as well as your understanding of what this process entails and anything else you feel called to share on this topic of tuning in and, and really connecting with your soul's calling. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a beautiful one. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, I tried to follow a more, a, a more conventional career, becoming a therapist, a psychologist, but that never felt in alignment. I felt like there was always this resistance or like the doors will not open. It was always like kind of like trying to force myself because that, you know, is something that is a lot more established in our, in our society. But to actually like connect with the deeper calling sometimes requires to be trailblazers, to actually trust that what our deepest calling and purpose may not be something that is recognized and that is something that is deeper. And so I feel like with the emergence of the new earth, there's this possibility of us really authentically 
aligning at the deepest level with what it is that we came here to do and connect with that deeper purpose. And the way you know that you are connected is that it will feel expansive. There's a, a liberation. There's a sense of like, oh, like a remembrance. So yeah, I came here to do this. I came here to serve in this way. So there's so much potential right now and opportunity for people to really reclaim their authentic power and their authentic purpose. It's just the times that we are navigating through that are a lot more flexible in that way. So yeah, you will know you will know it in your bones and blood when something feels in alignment with your truth. And there will be a lot less resistance and more of a sense of fulfillment that is, you know, beyond money or recognition. It's just a fulfillment of the soul, a deeper level of fulfillment. And what, what advice would you have for someone who is still in their nine to five job or some sort of capacity of work that is not fulfilling them, but they want to start connecting with this higher calling? What would you tell them? Sometimes we just have to take the leap of faith and really trust this calling. Um, again, it's sometimes not easy to become a trailblazer and to create or carve your own deeply connected soul purpose, but it's something that with courage and trust can happen. So yeah, just trusting, taking that leap of faith and asking for guidance along the way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're so we're so safe in what we know. So to be able to step out into the unknown, it is just that a leap of faith and to be able to place our faith in something greater than ourselves or something greater than we can even imagine is is such an act of devotion to life and passion for life, you know, why we're truly here. So that really resonates and and feels very true. And it does require a lot of trust, trust mm-hmm. and just discernment going, going for it. So I would love to ask you to share a little bit about your work with the Kerdos. Uh, this is a lineage that I am not super familiar with, and I would love for you to potentially introduce uh, our listeners a little bit to who the Keros Wisdom Keepers are and a little bit about the traditions that they carry. I'm very interested to hear about this lineage and this and this healing path. Yeah, thank you. So the Kero people are the last of the Inca people. Their blood goes back to the Inca. And when the conquest happened, they decided to flee to the Andes to preserve this body of knowledge and this body of wisdom that is very steep in the intelligence and the medicine of the earth, Pachamama. So a lot of the teachings that they share are informed by the forces of nature, being the Andes, the Apus, the earth, the cycles and the rhythms of the seasons. And they have a very clear, direct connection to the web of life and to nature. And so the transmissions, the wisdom that they share through the Misa, which is the the medicine bundle, carries this ancient wisdom. And the the reason why it has remained so intact and potent and pure is because they decided to flee and to sacrifice perhaps comfort in order to preserve this wisdom tradition that again is very much energetic and is in alignment again with the earth. So a lot of the wisdom is being sourced directly from the earth. And so they have, because of their purity and because how deeply connected they are, they are able to receive the downloads or the transmissions, the information directly from the earth mother and through, you know, their 
ability to, to decipher the language of the earth in the ways in which she speaks to them and speaks to the elders, then they are able, able to pass on those transmissions to people who are meant to be a carriers of this lineage that is very much a strong foundation for me, not only in my work, but also in my life. It has helped me to, you know, move more in cyclical ways, be more mindful of my blueprint, be more more mindful of my contributions. So, yeah, it's, it is just a very sacred and potent lineage. Mm. Beautiful. And I I would love to ask a little bit about how healing works in the Kedo tradition. When someone comes to the wisdom carriers and they are in need of healing, do the Kedos do some sort of investigation with the spirits? Do they offer payments? Could you talk a little bit about how they treat sickness and dis-ease? Oh, that's beautiful. They actually are masters at reading the energy field. So that can be the energy field of a body, a physical a human body, that can be the energy field of a land or a location. And when they read the energetics, they can find the places where there may be some um, imbalance or misalignment that needs to be corrected. And so they use the Misha, the medicine bundle, and within that Misha, they have sacred stones or kuyas that are charged with the medicine of Pachamama, of the earth. They, they are charged with the frequency of the Andes, the Apus, right? And so the, those stones carry that energy, and through that stones, they can basically remove stagnant energy that they call hucha. So they again, they work with the elements of nature, stones, sticks to do the healing. But yeah, it's mainly their ability to read at the energetics of the body, the physical body. Mm, it's and fascinating. Also, yes. And also they perform ceremonies, like ceremonies where the intention that the person or the community come in right relationship with themselves or in right relationship with a community. And so through those ceremonies, it can be a dispatcho, which is like, you know, bringing flowers, offerings, abundance, um, and asking for that balance. Or it can be through a fire ceremony. And so the, the ceremonies serve as a conduit for transformation and alchemy. Mm. Beautiful. And when they're focused, is their focus to bring balance to the energy? Is that their approach? That that disease is in balance in the body. They see it more as like you know energies that are stagnant. So more like what are the energetics? Right? Is the energy stagnant? Is it in balance? And how can we bring? like a higher, more refined energy, which they call Sami, like the refined energy from, let's say, the apples, right? And how they can bring that energy and let it run through the body. Just like, mm -hmm. you know, with the chakra system, it's like, you know, they feed the chakra systems through energy and prana. Well, the kettle feed the energy body through the summit, the refined energy that is available um, in those sacred spas that they call wakas. Wow. It's so, so profound, so esoteric. It's like, I feel it in my whole body just listening to you speak about this ancestral tradition. It's very activating. Mm -hmm. It's definitely very much alive. It's, it's a language that is alive. Mm -hmm. Would you be comfortable sharing a, a, a short introduction to the three worlds that you that you talk about and that are part of the Keros cosmology to give us an understanding of of the of the cosmology of the three worlds? Yeah, thank you. That is actually one of the places where the wisdom tradition of Anahuac, Mexico, is very similar to the cosmovision of the Andes, that mm. the shamanic practitioners, the elders of the ancient past, they used to be able to navigate those three dimensions of time. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, time runs 
in infinite cycles. And so with, with that understanding, then we can move through different timelines, timetables. The lower world or the Ukupacha is always the place where we store trauma, childhood trauma as the collective and personal unconscious. So like the things that we are unconscious of maybe or shadow aspects. And so the notion is that those imprints and those woundings are held compassionately by the earth mother, like the womb of the mother. That's the lower world. And it represents the serpent, just like in Anahuac, that was also represented by serpent medicine, right? That serpent that relates to healing, to shedding, to transformation, to symbolic death that happens in the underworld. And then this ordinary realm is called the Kaipacha, the middle world, where um, that's you know, how we show up, what is our contribution, what is our blueprint and how we interact, how we choose to be seen and how we see ourselves in this ordinary 3D world and reality. And then they have the Hanak Pacha, the upper world. And so in this timeline or in this realm, we had never been broken or fragmented. In this realm, we are held intact. And this is where we can connect with our higher self, with our um, divine blueprint, with our original blueprint. And it's also the place where we can get insight and revelation about our future, but about, but also the collective future. So when they talk about the new earth or the new Pachacuti in their language, they are referring to this time in the future or in the upper world where there's this possibility in this potential for bringing a new consciousness, a new evolutionary trajectory. And so it is their ability to travel up to that plane where they can receive the information, the downloads, because this realm of the Hanak Pacha is pure potential, is clear. There's no density or the struggles that we may encounter in, in, in the middle world, the Kai Pacha. Very, very fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing, Mary Lou. And to me, it's it's very intriguing because, you know, I study in the culture of Yahé with an Ingano botanist in Colombia. And the Inganos are also descendants of the Incas. And they also have the three worlds. And it's there's a lot of similarities there. And so it has me thinking, you know, is this is this Inca cosmology that then, you know, got passed down to the Queros and the other descendants and evolved with time with the cultures and traditions? Because there's similarities and there's also some differences, you know, with what you're sharing. But it's very interesting and very fascinating to to hear about. So thank you for sharing. I do feel that. That is part of the shamanic cosmology, the cosmovision. Uh-huh. And, and obviously, you know, there's some nuances and differences depending on what tradition or lineage we are talking about. But when we do shamanic war, we have this innate knowledge that we are no constrained just by this realm, by this mm-hmm. ordinary realm, that, but that we can navigate different realms and different time timelines. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's that's so eloquently said and, and very true. You know, it's ultimately how do we open ourselves to realize that we're more than just this body and that there there's more going on than just what we see through the physical eyes. So I love how, how you just said that. And um, I guess I'm curious, you know, what other teachings you might have to share with us regarding how we can utilize this cosmology, how we can utilize this understanding to inform our spiritual processes, to help us navigate strong spiritual experiences or passages that we go through, you know, in our healing journey. How does this awareness help us? How can it be a tool that we utilize to connect greater with the force of life? Yeah, thank you. Um, there is a very powerful piece here to um, the Quero Inca cosmovision, and it's the sacred chacana. Mm-hmm. 
So you mm -hmm. can think about the Chacana, which is a holy cross, as a medicine wheel that, you know, is connected to the four directions. And in each of those directions, there is a specific medicine, a specific um, alchemy um, that is also connected to an animal ally. So for instance, in the South, uh, we connect with serpent. And then in the West, we connect to the medicine of jaguar and discernment, personal power. In the North, we connect to the hummingbird, to the ancestors, to the ancient ones. And then in the East, we connect to the condor and the higher vision and also to that Hanak Pacha, the higher realm. So as when we work with this map, this um, compass, we can't, you know, use each of those directions and their specific medicines and frequencies to not only heal ourselves, but also like to call back our power to regain our vision and our clarity. And so there are some practices that um, I usually teach when I teach um, within the Chakana Cosmo Vision in how we can, again, use this map um, to help us to evolve our consciousness. So, yeah, that's one of those major pieces that relates to this body of knowledge, the knowledge of the chakrana and um, how it is connected to not only the directions and how through working with that map, we can come back to our center, to our place of orientation within. Mm. So beautiful. I love that. And um, I definitely want to get more into hearing a little bit more about the work that you do. And I guess before we segue into that, I'm curious if you could share a little bit of, of how we can start to live in greater connection with the earth and how we can start to live more in sync and uh, in um, union and harmony with Mother Nature and with her natural rhythms. Mm, thank you. I think that one of the reasons as to why the indigenous elders, not only of Peru, but of many places in the world are returning and very generously sharing their wisdom and their traditions is because that wisdom is rooted in sustainable living and right relationship and reciprocal exchanges, right? So as we connect to this body of knowledge and as the elders make their cosmologies and medicines available, I feel that that is what's going to help us to shift the value systems that we have adopted and the way we have been programmed to relate to the earth, right? Like to know that the earth is not here for our use and exploitation. She is an energy. She has intelligence. And so um, there's so much that we can learn with, you know, coming into right relation in contact with those traditions and the elders. So what I feel is that we are going to have to shift not only our value systems, but also to really self-examine and realize that it's just not sustainable in the long run, you know, the, the paradigm that we are living under. So we are going to have to come back to living in more cyclical conscious ways. And this is where all of this ancient medicine and wisdom is going to become the new medicine for the new earth. It's beautiful. I think that it's, it's so very potent and true because we're living at this really pivotal time where these traditions that have been hidden for centuries, deep, deep, deep in, in the forests and in the mountains are, are finding their way out, you know? And so we're at this time where humanity's needing so deeply tools to heal and to remember and to return 
and it's happening, it's synchronizing, you know, with this beautiful uh, coming out of these traditions that are the very balm, the very medicine that that all of humanity is needing. And so I, I always just find myself so grateful to be living at this time in humanity's evolution, especially as someone walking this path with the plants, walking this path with the ancestral traditions to get to witness this incredible synchronicity and sharing. And it's truly like the art of compartir, you know, it's the art of sharing that we're, we're able to come together truly as one nation, as one race, as one people uh, to heal, to remember. So that really just hits and resonates so so deeply with what you're sharing because it, it's really how do we come back to the mama? How do we come back to the mother and remember that she is our mother, you know? And and I love I love hearing uh, these words that you're sharing because it's just it's just igniting my own love and devotion to her, you know. Yeah, I think again one of the very important uh, pieces here is that yes, the elders are very generously and lovingly sharing this ancient wisdom medicine that has never left the memory of the earth and our place within the wealth of life. But it's important that, yes, we are being called to be stewards of the earth, medicine women, wisdom keepers, but there's a time on our approach. It's not something that we just do. It's something that we become and it's a daily practice. And it's also important that we when we are in the presence of the elders, that we don't erase their names, that we engage in reciprocal fair exchanges with them so that we are not replicating this colonial imprint of, you know, taking and then erasing the people and erasing the names. So how, again, we can't be worthy medicine women, medicine men, uh, elders, wisdom keepers without causing more harm to those traditions and teachings. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. That's an important uh, foundational pillar, I think, that we have to learn how to orient ourselves around. And I think one of the main things that you just touched on is, is finding elders, you know, because oftentimes we get empowered through the plants or we get empowered through our own healing journey and it's very easy to affirm that we are healed that we are healers and this is very very beautiful you know to feel that connection that life force moving through you but we are very new to the path and it's easy to get swept up and caught up with this idea that that our connection perhaps with the medicines is from many, many lifetimes or it's ancestral, right? We have such a deep connection with these plants that we all of a sudden, there's this, this sense and it, it comes a lot from our conditioning in the Western world of just our, our entitlement. But we very, very quickly go into this place of, of thinking that we are we are carriers or that we're worthy of being the the ambassadors or faces or representation of an entire culture that doesn't even belong to us you know so how do we how do we go about doing it with grace and subtlety and i think you just said it finding the wisdom teachers and keepers and lifting those voices up so that they really become the spokespeople or the guides of this I don't want to call it a movement, but literally the medicines are moving, you know, they're moving out of the jungle. So in some ways it is this movement, this evolution that's taking place. And so that's a lot of the work that we do at Four Visions. We are constantly working with different indigenous leaders and spiritual teachers to help share their messages and their stories and to give them a platform to share about their culture, what their communities are working through or the challenges that their communities are facing, um, what their goals are or their visions are, you know, and to really create that spaciousness so that we are truly in service. And Four Visions is a platform that really wants to be a service to both the, the Western world, as well as our Indigenous partners. And so it's a constant study of how we, we do both, you know, provide these medicines and these tools, as well as be um, an ear for listening to what is really needed and what is really being asked of us. Yes, absolutely. 
conscious fair partnership is very important. Um, yeah, and you know, one of the things that I feel we need to learn is to really get curious and to be listeners, to be mm -hmm. good listeners, especially as Westerners, to be humble, to listen, to pay attention. It's time that, you know, again, the voices that have been denied, that they speak their own experiences. And that, again, we are humble enough to listen to the wisdom. Mm -hmm. Yes, this this theme of listening, it's so beautiful and, and has so many layers too. I remember, you know, many years ago thinking I was hearing what my teachers were telling me. And then it wasn't often until much later, many years later, that I the teachings really penetrated. And so I feel that this this practice of opening ourselves to receive uh, in a good way and and really opening to hear like what is really being said because oftentimes we think we understand or we jump to a conclusion but we don't really take the time to allow the, the teaching to penetrate and the the where it's coming from the long lineage the long ancestry the the thousands of years and generations that this this seed thought is coming from it's it's so profound you know and to really give that spaciousness to receive a teaching in its fullest capacity. Yes, I love those last words. Yes, so much medicine there. Thank you. Mm. So I would love to talk a little bit about your work and to learn a little bit more about what you do. I know that you offer a variety of programs and I guess like one thing I would love for you to start off and then we can kind of go into you sharing about your programs is what is the path of the medicine woman for to you and in your experience? Because I know you do a lot of work surrounding the feminine. So if you could introduce us to what that means, the path of the medicine woman in your words. Mm, thank you. So the main, I think our main purpose is to be priestesses anchoring in the new timeline and to be of service to our evolution as, you know, as a collective. And also our role is to bring repair to the relationships we have, whether those relationships are human or more than human with animals and with plants. So like, what is our role as keepers, right? As medicine women, how are we bringing repair to our communities? That is the main, I feel that that's the main emphasis right now. How can we usher forward this new earth in service, in service to the web of life, the collective and our shared future. And when I offer programs that connect us to the divine feminine, what really is, is the connection to the feminine energy of the planet, the connection to the earth herself. So she may have many different faces or expressions as, as feminine, right? But it is actually serving this template of the earth mother as a sentient being that is calling her daughters to remember what it is to live in more cyclical ways, what it is to pay attention to our bodies when we take care of our bodies, we are also taking care of the body of the earth mother. Mm -hmm. So in my programs, I teach women like how, how to tune to their own rhythms, to their own cycles. If they're still um, in their bleeding years, like are they paying attention to those cycles and how, um, again, by being in that right relationship with their own bodies and with the women in their families, how that reflects as being in that right relationship with the earth mother. And so the divine feminine then is, a, she's an essence. She is the energy that permeates our life. And, you know, this planet is, we just have forgotten how it is to commune with her and to be in right relationship with, with her. Mm -hmm. I love that because it kind of goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning with, you know, learning how to 
honor the mother and learning how to honor the earth. It starts with us and so many of us as women, as men too, you know, we're so, we're so numb to our own bodies and they, our physical vessels are that first portal, that first point to the creation, to the great mother and the great father. It's here within, within these bodies that we inhabit. And so I think that these, these teachings that help people to drop in and connect more with this physical spirit that we, uh, that we are inhabiting is, is so important. And I think a lot of our listeners would be very interested to learn more with, from you and to um, get to receive more of your incredible wisdom and would love for you to share your Instagram as well as your website and any other program that you have coming up that you might want to let everyone know about. Yeah, thank you. There's something that you just mentioned that I think carries a lot of wisdom is that both men and women, we need to really self-examine how do we relate to the body of women, right? Mm -hmm. Mothers, daughters, girlfriends, partners, how do we, because that reflects and says so much about how we relate to the greater mother of the earth, like the, mm -hmm. her body, right? Her cycles. And so the more in tune we are with, again, being in the right relationship with the bodies, the more that is going to be mirror in our collective. And again, with the earth herself. So yeah, my website for people who wish to know more about my practice and my teachings is Kawak, K-A-W-A-K, energymedicine.com. My Instagram is Marilu, M-A-R-I-L-U dot Shen. My last name is H-I-N-N. And I share a lot, again, about the feminine in those times there. And I have an upcoming program that is called The Return of the Divine Feminine, The New Myth. And it's, again, like making this shift from a goal-oriented patriarchal way of relating to a more cyclical, sustainable way of being that honors the rhythms and the cycles of the earth, the rhythms and the cycles of the moon. So that mm -hmm. is a 13-week program and it's offered to women who are embarking not only on their own self-healing journey, but that are heading or hearing the call of the her mother wanting us to remember and to be worthy stewards of herself and the wisdom and the medicine that we are being gifted with at this time. So beautiful, so necessary. Thank you for that work that you are doing. And we will definitely put uh, those links in our show notes so that our listeners can go and visit and check out this program and follow more of your journey. And yeah, just really, really grateful to get to connect with you. And um, it's been such an incredible conversation and lots of beautiful seeds, you know, to meditate on and reflect on and just let continue, uh, continue allowing them to sink in more and more. So really appreciate uh, everything that you've shared with us today. And um, I just want to ask if there's anything else that you want to share with our community, you know, and now that you are learning a little bit more about who we are, and perhaps you have a message for our listeners or, you know, the, we, we are full of a lot of open minded people who are walking a healing path, who are wanting to learn in the, a good way, who are wanting to respect the medicines and the traditions that they come from. So I wanted to open the space for you to share a message or a teaching or anything from your heart to uh, all of our listeners. Mm. I feel that the message that I keep hearing is this call to become worthy stewards of the earth, worthy medicine people, medicine women, and to walk this path with reverence, with devotion. The earth does need us to embody those archetypes that we have been forgotten. And so if you are being called to walk this path that you trust and that you take that sacred leap of faith, yeah. And once you do, there's so much support there in the scene mm -hmm. and in the scene realms. Mm -hmm. 
Aho. Beautifully said. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mariah, mm. for having me. It's been so beautiful to share and get to know more about your work in the community. So mm. thank you. Thank you, Mary Lou. God bless you. And thank you to everyone for tuning in to this episode. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. From everyone at the Four Visions Market family, we would like to thank you for listening to our podcast. We really hope that you've enjoyed the conversation and gained many new insights on plant medicines, ancestral wisdom, and much more. Please remember to visit our website at www.fourvisionsmarket.com for more resources and information on plant medicine and spiritual tools. And please don't forget to follow us across social media for regular updates on upcoming episodes. We are grateful for your support and look forward to continuing this path with you all. Until next time, take care, stay present and stay connected.